Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Tangle Podcast, the place we get views from across the political spectrum, some independent thinking, and a little bit of my take. I'm your host, Isaac Saul, and today we are sitting down with Dave Gardner. Dave spent the bulk of his career as a filmmaker working for PBS and some other major brands. And in 2011, he put out the documentary Growth Busters, Hooked on Growth, which argued that our addiction to unending growth in a world that has limits is driving issues like water shortages, hunger, energy scarcity, and even the risk of species extinction. Today, Dave co-hosts the podcast Growth Busters and is trying to help the world come to terms with the fact that we just can't keep growing, I think. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for tackling this subject. Yeah, I'm really interested to speak with you. I mean, we got a chance to talk a little bit before we came on. And I said, you know, as somebody in the political reporting space, I've had these criticisms of kind of the degrowth movement come up and come across my desk, but I've never actually gotten a chance to sit down and interview somebody in your position who's kind of advocating for the degrowth position. So I'm really interested to chat with you. And I guess, you know, for our listeners who may not have any baseline understanding of what your expertise is and what you've been kind of putting out for the better parts of the last decade, I'm wondering if you could maybe just explain degrowth to me. What is it and why, in your view, do we need it? Um, Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, I think there's this fundamental kernel of knowledge that we have to start with, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. And that is that we need to understand that we are in overshoot today. The, The human species is in overshoot. And what that means is that we are asking of the planet, demanding even of the planet, more than she can sustainably provide year after year after year. Uh, there's uh, You mentioned some of the evidence that we're in overshoot, and there is plenty more. It's estimated that we might have less than 60 harvests left before there's just nothing in the soils that we're farming today left to, uh, to meet our needs. And in fact, you probably know we... Uh, have to enhance those soils and fertilize them like crazy to make them productive today. And of course, climate disruption is one of the biggest pieces of evidence that there's uh, that the scale of the human enterprise has outgrown the planet. And so degrowth is a, a really a major response to that. Uh, the scale of the human enterprise is really uh, the, the, the number of us on the planet and the size of our global economy. Those two things are what work together to uh, really what they're doing is they're killing the planet right now. And if we keep it up, what we're doing today, uh, we will have a dead planet. We will not leave anything for our kids and future generations to, to work with. Uh, we are, we've been chipping away at it, scientists estimate, since uh, the 1970s. Uh, we kind of, we kind of, surpassed the ability of the planet to meet our needs in the 70s. And we just kept on going. And we were able to do that because we are uh, slowly mining some of the non-renewable resources and using them. And and we're not going to see the the negative consequences of that until we really run out of those or there or there are so few of those left that it's just insanely expensive and destructive to uh, to get at those. And of course, it could be argued that we're already experience some, some of that today. Um, and so uh, so what do we do? We, we've got to shrink the scale of the human enterprise. We got to shrink the number of people and we need to shrink the economy. And degrowth is typically, mostly people think about that as applied to the economy. And it's, it's the opposite of economic growth. And economic growth is the, uh, it's just universally thought of as, you know, it's the most universally sought after goal on the planet. There's nothing else that is so commonly pursued uh, and it's pursued so much that we've just assumed that, well, of course, economic growth is good and it's what we need. It's unquestioned. And uh, I, I go after journalists a lot uh, and, and you among them uh, for, for not giving us a, a more balanced message out there about what's going on in the economy. Um, But I don't blame journalists like you because you, just like me, we all grew up uh, programmed, conditioned to believe that economic growth is the holy grail. And uh, we do not get any other 
uh, perspective on that from the mainstream media. The AP, every quarter when they report U.S. GDP estimates, uh, the people that they go to for sound bites are people who are really steeped in this uh, Ponzi economy. There are a few economists out there and many scientists out there who will tell you the truth that you cannot grow the economy forever. And that, in fact, we've already exceeded the optimal size for our economy. And so we're now in uneconomic growth. And that's really why so many things are are crumbling today, uh, because we've, uh, you know, the costs of growth far exceed the benefits of growth today. So degrowth is uh, uh, a paradigm where economists and scientists are trying to figure out, okay, what does a healthy 21st, 21st century economy look like? It looks like nothing like what we've been doing for the last 200 years, because we've been on a binge for 200 years. We've got to completely rethink our economic goals so that we don't end up with a dead planet. So I'm curious, I mean, let's accept kind of the underlying premise. I'm sure there are people who would push back on you about, you know, like the the limit or the finiteness of some of the resources that we're using. But I think it's interesting for me to kind of work from that position. Like, let's say your expectations about where the planet is heading and, and kind of where we are, are accurate. Why can't we, you know, change the way that we're behaving in a way that both benefits the economy and the environment? I mean, I guess like the the simple thought that comes to my mind is we transition to green energy. We have more electric cars and windmills and solar power. That kind of thing could create a lot of jobs. Now we're seeing things like solar are, you know, is cheaper than natural gas in some places. You know, we could go that direction and experience that kind of economic growth and also do it in a way that's more sustainable than maybe what we did to get here. Why isn't that an option in your eyes or why does that calculus not play out? Well, a lot of, a lot of people have been working on that for a while and um, we don't necessarily have a whole lot to show for it so far. And even not even myself, I really was hopeful that green energy was going to be a uh, uh, the the savior in terms of just the climate disruption that we're uh, involved in right now. But I uh, once I started digging into that, and what, that's what I do is I'm not a scientist. I'm a in a way a, a journalist. I kind of participate more in advocacy journalism because I have a point of view, and I just can't leave that leave that alone and pretend to be objective like you do such a good job of doing. <laughs> um, so uh, so I was hopeful about green energy, but all of the serious scientists and uh, that I have been paying attention to for years and have been pointing out to me that uh, the, the studies they've done indicate that we cannot run this trillion dollar global economy on renewable energy. One is if we were able right now, you know, we're just it's a small percentage of the economy that's running on wind and solar and geothermal and hydro right now, um, in order to scale up the infrastructure to generate all of that uh, solar energy and wind energy primarily, we would have to burn so much of our fossil fuel inventory to just to manufacture all that, that we would blow the climate, we would blow the climate up. We would be well beyond our carbon budget, uh, just trying to create that infrastructure. Um, so we can't do that. So we have we have to have a smaller amount of renewable energy than it would be required to run this crazy economy we've got right now. And of course, the minerals required to uh, to build the solar panels and the wind turbines are somewhat limited. And of course, there's a heavy environmental impact of of doing all that mining, and there are, are limits to those resources as well. Probably the best study that I've seen of it was really, uh, has been around a long time. It was put out by the Post Carbon Institute. They did some serious calculations because they wanted to know, is this going to be our, our savior? And the, the conclusion they reached was, well, it'll probably play an important role, but we have got to go on an energy diet. We have got to figure out a way to simplify uh, everything about what we're doing, simplify our own individual lives and simplify our economy so that we can stop burning fossil fuels and rely on renewable energy going into the future. But 
it's not going to meet our needs unless we scale way back. I'm curious. I mean, when I hear, you know, scale back, degrowth, I mean, obviously we're talking a little bit about economic stuff, but I think, you know, in at least in my understanding of it, part of this has to involve kind of controlling population growth, which becomes a really tricky issue. Arguments, you know, against overpopulation have been used in the past for policies like China's one child policy and forced sterilization in India and all these places where we've seen kind of the horror story outcome of that. How do you respond to people who would say like, these policies have been tried and we've seen them fail? And, you know, what are your solutions? What kind of alternative solutions do you have for how we might be able to limit something like population growth? Well, I wouldn't propose population control to begin with because uh, it's uh, that's a really sensitive subject. And a lot of people feel like they have uh, they have the right to choose how many children they have. And maybe they do. Let's assume that they do. Uh, the good news is that voluntarily we've been doing the right thing for the last 50 years. Uh, humankind has gone from average family size of five or six kids to an average family size of just a little over two worldwide in 50 years without those coercive measures. Uh, so, so on the population front, we uh, really just need to celebrate uh, the family size decisions that women are making. And, and it would be good for us to accelerate that trend uh, to support them more. Um, and it would also be important for us to not listen to the growth-addicted economists who are busy today wringing their hands about the fact that uh, that the uh, peak population is in sight. They're really worried in many countries around the world that are already either experiencing population contraction or they see that on the horizon. They're thinking, they're freaking out. They're saying, oh my gosh, how are we going to have GDP growth if we're not growing the number of consumers, the number of workers, and the number of taxpayers. Well, what I would say to that is, wow, that's a really lousy reason to bring a child into the world because we need another consumer, taxpayer, or, or worker. That, that's not why we give birth to <laughs> our children. Uh, uh, they're human beings. Uh, and two, the economy only needs to be big enough to meet the needs of the people it serves. So if we do have a, a population peak, better sooner than, than later, uh, as the population contracts, the economy can contract too, because it has fewer people to serve. But this, uh, we've become so obsessed with GDP growth that so many of us aren't doing that calculus so far. Yeah, that makes some sense to me. I think like, you know, when you look at the, the economic side of things, a similar reaction, you know, when you talk about how we can actually make the population or how we can actually make our, our consumption a little smaller is that we can't really do that without significant hardship in rich countries or kind of limiting the growth of poorer countries. I'm wondering, you know, in your mind, what does that look like to you? Is it, is it consuming less? Is it kind of reducing our quality of life standards in a way that is acceptable to some people? I mean, like really, where do we make these changes, I guess, is something I'm curious about. Well, we explore ways to consume less, uh, to make individual choices on the Growth Busters podcast quite a bit. In fact, we try not to ever let an episode go by where we don't explore that a little bit. Uh, but it's interesting. One is that I think we need to get over our uh, conflating economic growth with well-being. Uh, we've just had this robust economic growth for a couple hundred years, and that happens to correlate with a time when we've made a lot of improvements in our lives, right? Things have gotten a lot better. We've got electricity. We've got indoor plumbing. Um, the assumption has, has been, oh, well, that's because we had economic growth. But when you think about it, did, you know, what, what does the invention of electricity have to do with GDP growth? Or what does indoor plumbing have to do with, the, with GDP growth? Um, they, you really don't have to have that to be an innovator. You just have to have uh, innovators. <laughs> now, maybe those were able to scale up faster because there was a, plenty of money bouncing around in the economy to to help that scale up fast. But um, but GDP is not a good measure of well-being. Uh, most 
uh, most intelligent people who've looked at that around the world have, have come to that conclusion. Um, but we just can't get out of the habit of using GDP as a metric for success. It's not a good metric for success. And today, it's actually a better measure of how fast we're destroying the planet. So uh, there's better, uh, better ways to evaluate uh, the success of economy, and that's by looking at uh, how, how healthy people are, how happy people are, are their basic needs met. And um, in the, here in the overdeveloped world, we, you know, we way overdid it, and we, it wouldn't be that painful for us to scale back. Uh, in the, what, they're, what they like to call the developing world, I, I would call the yet-to-be-overdeveloped world, they certainly have a right to, um, to consume more than they do today because they're consuming so little. Um, but I wouldn't use uh, economic growth as a, as a term to apply what needs to happen for them. We need to find ways to uh, make room for them so that they can have their needs met. But let's not get hung up on growing their economy because that's the mistake we made. We thought we needed to grow our economy. We didn't. We just needed to take care of things, make sure that people had financial security, shelter, food on the table, things like that. And so what I'm trying to describe to you, I think, is redefining economic success and, and coming up with a better way of talking about what a healthy 21st century economy is and, and measuring it as well. So what are some better ways to, to measure it? I mean, I actually agree with the idea that GDP has seemed to me for a long time like a bad way to measure the economy. I mean, I've said in editions of my newsletter and past writing, even before I started Tangle on this podcast, that it always struck me like we should be asking people more questions about whether they're making rent and affording their health care and what their you know, what their food yeah. situation is like, these kinds of things mm -hmm. versus, you know, how much the major corporations in our country grew. I mean, I see the value of that in some way, but it, it never made sense to me that it's like the primary thing we go to. So I'm curious what you view, you know, if you could snap your fingers and bring in some different metrics that were being featured in those Associated Press articles you're talking about, what would that look like to you? Well, there are people around the world working on that right now. There's the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, who's uh, got members, uh, intelligent members, economists, and uh, uh, academics around the world who are working together to figure out how do we define a well-being economy, what are the right measures, genuine progress indicators is kind of a, of a common one. Um, and I couldn't give, give you a list necessarily of the, of the nations today that have adopted those. But even where they've been adopted, it's really hard to get out of the habit of, uh, you, you probably shouldn't stop watching GDP, but like I said, you should just be watching that as a measure of the destruction you're doing. Um, Canada, a guy named Mike Nickerson worked really hard to get Canada to ad adopt genu genuine progress indicators. And I think that stalled out. Uh, there's an absolutely brilliant economist named Kate Rayworth who developed a, a way of thinking and measuring and, and looking at economic well-being called donut economics, where uh, the center of the donut is... Uh, kind of the bare minimum of, that the economy needs to be doing to meet everybody's basic needs. The outside of the donut are the kind of the planetary boundaries where if the economy, if economic activity exceeds those boundaries, then we're starting to chip away at uh, life-supporting ecosystems and we don't want to exceed those. So, uh, so donut economics is a uh, is really taking off and city by city and nation by nation, uh, governments are adopting do donut economics as a, as a new paradigm. So I would say to, uh, to the mainstream media when they're reporting on whether US GDP went, went up or down in the last quarter, I would say, call Kate Rayworth and see what she has to say about it. Or call Brian Check, who's the executive director of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy and see what he has to say about it. These are people who are really smart and know economics, but they're not addicted to growth. So I'm um, just like thought experiment. I'm curious to put this to you and see what you say. I am, you know, married. I have no kids. I live in Philadelphia. I live in actually a up space that's probably bigger than I need. It's a row home. Uh, you know, two bedrooms, two bathrooms. I own a car. 
my wife drives to work every day. Uh, you know, I'm eating three meals a day, good amount of meat, you know, like what is someone like me? I think living a fairly average life, you know, how does my world change in, in this world that you're envisioning? I mean, what, what's different for me or is someone like me not going to see much change in the degrowth world? I mean, how do you see this playing out? Well, you're not doing too bad and you're kind of, you are, as you said, kind of in that average lane. And of course, it's more important to help the people who are the one percenters, the five percenters, even the 10 percenters uh, get get out of their overconsuming paradigm. The things that we have absolutely got to stop doing is having multiple homes, um, you know, a vacation home. Uh, where you're playing golf in the south in the winter time, or a vacation home uh, in ski country, you've got to just have one home. Uh, we've got to get over this trophy house uh, obsession that we have, where people think that they've got to have five, six, ten thousand square foot houses. As a really, why do they need those? Really, it's just a symbol of success. It's a status symbol. Uh, the people living in those houses aren't any happier than you are living in your. What maybe twenty five hundred square foot row house maybe yeah um, that yeah 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 um, it doesn't bring them any more happiness in fact it's really kind of a pain in the butt they have to hire somebody just to manage the damn household when it's ten thousand square foot, square feet um, now eating a lot of meat that's an area where it's really easy for us to shrink our footprint pretty quickly is to uh, eat a lot less meat. I haven't been able to bring myself to embrace veganism just yet. I feel like I should, but I eat meat maybe once a week or twice a week at at most. I'm much more of a plant based diet, uh, and that helps. Um, but you know, a lot of people worry about: isn't this going to be a, a, a kill? this is going to be a deal deal killer? I'm going to have to make all these sacrifices if we have to shrink our consumption. But the truth is, most of us, too many of us are on a treadmill in service to this growth-based economy. And we, because we bought into it, uh, we're working ourselves to death. Uh, all of the family, I think of all the families who do have uh, a condo in Scottsdale, let's say that they've got to make payments on that. They've got to make payments on a trophy house uh, somewhere in the middle of the country. Uh, it's, it's hard for them to get off the treadmill. So we've got to figure out a way to help people get out of debt, get off the treadmill, and re recognize that when you slow down, then you can really get in touch with the true joys of life. You know that old adage, uh, no one on their deathbed ever said, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> well, on your deathbed, what do you wish you had done? What, what, what do you wish you had spent more time doing? Uh, spending time with the people you love, sitting on the porch, uh, you know, with your kids, reading them a story or, uh, or with, your, with your partner, walking hand in hand, enjoying nature with your partner, having uh, maybe a neighborhood picnic with your, with your neighbors, you know, spending more time with your friends. Uh, it's more about love. In fact, Mike Nickerson, I mentioned the Canadian who was behind the Genuine Progress Indicator Movement up there. He calls them the three L's, uh, loving, learning, and shoot, I'm going to forget the third L. <laughs> Dang it. Loving, learning, it'll come to me. Um, those things don't have a heavy footprint, and they are so much more important than uh, than. Having all of these status symbols, having the nice car, uh, things that I've done, uh, I uh, ride my bike in, instead of getting in an automobile every chance I get. And it's, it's not a sacrifice. It's a joy. It's, you know, I'm out, I'm in the outdoors, I'm getting exercise. I spend less time at the gym because I spend, get a lot of exercise going to, to meetings and, uh, and the like. And I notice things that I would never notice when I was whipping by them in an automobile. Um, so those are some of the, just, just a few of the joys. But it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a shakeup if we, the Global Footprint Network estimates that we're just about globally at two, two planet living right now. We're demanding almost twice what we should be demanding of the planet if we want the human race to go on. And if we want future generations to have a shot at a decent life. Uh, so we got to cut in, cut that in half globally. But of course, here in the United States, we're more like five planet living. So we've got to cut back to about 20 percent. 
And that is a, that's a big shift. Uh, it, it would, you know, we can't just snap our fingers and do that. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why it would be smart for us to really embrace the population contraction that's going on right now, too, because uh, population contraction could do a, a big share of the shrinking of the scale of the human footprint that, that needs to happen. And then it's a little bit more likely that uh, just the rest of us living modest lives, will uh, the, the math will work. And when you say that population contraction, you mean what we're already experiencing kind of continuing that basically? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we've got to stop listening to, uh, you know, there are uh, people like uh, Mike Lee and Mitt Romney in Washington, D.C., who are, they're expressing alarm about the fact that we're not having enough babies. We're not, the fertility rate's declining in the U.S. It's below replacement rate. Uh, They're worried about it. Uh, and we need to somehow find a way to educate them so that they understand that, no, this is perfectly natural. Women are doing what they want to do. They're, they, they're finding other ways to have meaningful lives other than having six kids and being stuck being a, uh, being a mom for most of their lives. They can do so many other things that contribute to society and give uh, meaning to their lives. And... In the process, if we can embrace that, ignore those people who are trying to get us uh, to start making more babies, then that uh, I think that trend can accelerate. Uh, it'd be perfect if in 100 years we were back down to about 2 billion people on the planet instead of today's eight. That sounds like a huge shift. But we could actually be pretty close to that if we just uh, had an average of about one and a half kids per family instead of the today's average and the in the world of two, about two and a half kids per family. So, you know, one of the things that those people who are worried about our slowing population growth say is that basically what's going to happen in America is what we're sort of seeing happening in countries like Japan right now, where the population is aging and there aren't enough people working, creating kind of the economic engine that we need to support the, the aging population in the country. So like in the United States, how that might play out in, in this narrative is there's way fewer workers. And so the government's collecting, you know, less social security tax. So there's less money going into programs that are supposed to take care of our senior citizens. And then we see those systems kind of collapse. And this older generation is left basically without the kind of care or comfort or retirement or, you know, post-work life that previous generations had. How, how do you think about that concept? Because I'm assuming you don't want there to be a huge economic collapse that ruins senior citizens' lives in, in you know, the Americas and Europe and across the world. Oh, there's so many, uh, so many angles to take on that. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, one is if, uh, you know, what I'm proposing is that we uh, that we take the bull by the horns and we start working on this now so that we can have a more elegant solution to overshoot. If we do nothing, uh, then we are going to have a dead planet and it's going to be really ugly. So uh, dealing with these challenges like the the, the, the temporary bubble of, age, of uh, more elderly people as we get over this, uh, you know, 300 year spurt of, uh, of population growth that uh, dealing with that, there's going to be some inconveniences, but if you're, if you're the, if you get to pull the lever the policy lever, uh, are you going to say, Oh yeah, that's just too much trouble. Let's just kill the planet. I don't think you're going to pull that lever. Are you? We're not, we don't want to kill the planet. So we have got to find a way to come to terms and somehow elegantly, uh, you know, turn off the turbochargers and slow down the economic engine. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's some tweaks to be made. But, uh, you know, as, as we have more elderly for a while, we're having fewer and fewer uh, children. And so the people who were uh, in the economy taking care of those kids can be um, moved into positions where they're taking care of the elderly. So it's not like we're going to run out of people to to work in the nursing homes and things like that. Uh, we definitely are going to have to do some, uh, make some adjustments to the social security system, for example. All of those systems were really built for a Ponzi scheme. Uh, 
you know, everybody just assumed we were just going to grow forever. Uh, we just got to, you know, we got to stop the Ponzi scheme. It can't, it cannot, it just cannot go on forever. And you mentioned Japan and just quickly, Japan's an easy thing to talk about because it's an island, right? Today, uh, the people in Japan, they cannot feed the people of Japan just by growing food on, in Japan. They have to import a lot of their food. So would you say to the people of Japan, well, we need to have this robust economic engine, so get busy making more babies. We need the population to grow to stoke the fires of this economic engine. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, you're going to have to somehow compete with the the rest of the world for your food because we won't we won't be able to meet our needs you know with the with the country with the geography of the country we have it just seems like that's kind of dead planet policy and i would i would advise japan against that kind of thinking so i i know it's a little euphemistic but i actually think it's kind of critical to the conversation and maybe i should have asked this question in the beginning but you know you mentioned the that we're going to kill the planet, that we don't want to end up with a dead planet. Uh, what do you mean when you say that? I mean, practically speaking, obviously, at least my understanding, the planet can't necessarily die in the sense that, you know, it's going to probably outlast all of us. And the most likely outcome, if we really are on a path towards destroying, it seems like we kind of get wiped out and planet Earth sort of uh, recalibrate. So when you talk about you know, a dead planet. What are the things that you're seeing now and also the things that you're expecting to happen in the future that sort of encapsulate that that euphemism that you're using? You know, a lot of people used to say, you know, we don't need to save the planet. The planet will take care of itself, right? And you're kind of alluding to that a little bit. It'll be here long after the human race is, is gone, uh, whether that's in 100 years or 200 years or 200,000 years. Um, but you know what? When you see what's going on, you know, they call, call this era the, the Anthrop Anthropocene now because we have just gotten so big on the planet. Uh, the, uh, the chemicals, the harmful chemicals that we have invented like PFAS, you can't find a corner of the planet where that chemical doesn't exist. And that's a chemical that, that causes birth defects in human babies. And it's not, uh, we assume that it's doing the same thing for animals. Uh, we are extinguishing other species now at a really alarming rate, maybe a hundred or more times faster than historically. Um, is that fair? You know, don't we owe those other species a chance to live just like us? Uh, and even if we don't, even if their existence is just to meet our needs, which I would never say, um, they're part of this intricate web of life that we depend on. And the more when we disrupt that, we do that at our peril and it's making it harder and harder for this planet to meet our needs. Uh, I was just commenting to my wife this morning. We went on a bike ride and we were riding next to this open field. And I said, have you noticed I just don't see nearly the number of flying insects above this field as you, as you normally do. Uh, people are starting to comment on that. They see fewer uh, pollinators, uh, fewer insects. Um, and those are, you know, when you see those, those are signs that the web of life is, is functioning. And you start uh, taking out some pieces of that web of life, you discover, you know, there's all these unintended consequences. So... Uh, uh, so species extinction, uh, you know, we're pumping the world's rivers and aquifers dry. The Ogallala Aquifer, they're starting to count the number of years before they think they're not going to be able to pump. Most of the wells aren't going to be able to pump out of the Ogallala Aquifer. And that uh, grows a lot of our food in the nation's breadbasket. Uh, there's already, uh, is it Egypt is, uh, I can't remember now if it's Egypt or Saudi Arabia, is importing um, alfalfa from Arizona because Saudi Arabia. Saudi yeah. Arabia, yeah. Are you you know when that's happening? You know they've already uh, dried up the Nile for for all practical purposes, and there have been wars, and there will continue to be wars about the water that remains in the Nile and and other rivers around the world. You, you know those are just all signs that. You know, the, the, the end of growth is here. We're living the end of growth. And it's just a matter of whether we fight it and have this ugly uh, 
end where maybe there will be a few human beings left, but it will be nothing like the society that we all assume is going to go on forever? Or, or can we come to terms with that and find a way to say, okay, maybe more shouldn't be our mantra. Maybe enough should be our mantra. I'm curious if you have taken some of your ideas to, you know, economic researchers or policymakers or people in positions to kind of facilitate the spread of them and, and what the reaction you've run into has been like, or, or the degrowth movement in general. I mean, or at least in America, as far as I know, you know, I don't hear any members of Congress talking about embracing a degrowth ideology. Uh, I'm wondering if you've seen it spread or what the response has been like, and, and if it has been negative, why you think that's the case. You know, I wonder what you think about that term degrowth. I'm not, I'm not really crazy about it. I wish they could have come up with a better word, but <clears throat> degrowth seems to be the one that, that stuck. Uh, and the degrowth movement really uh, had a lot of its origins in Europe. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the European, you know, we could look to the Europeans for some some good models and some good direction. And, and degrowth in Europe is starting to really get some legs. Uh, the, the OECD, uh, the Organization for European something in development. Got to get that. Got to get my cheat sheet together on that. Uh, OECD is starting to talk about degrowth and looking at that and inviting speakers. The U.S. Uh, seems to be slower to catch on. Uh, there have been some degrowth conferences in Canada. Uh, there's a, a brilliant economist in Canada, Peter Victor, who has put together a model uh, to where you can kind of run the, run the numbers. And his model shows that you can uh, have uh, everybody's needs met and the government doesn't go bankrupt as you slowly reduce the size of your economy. Uh, now, whether the um, the people who are pulling the policy levers are embracing that. I haven't really seen any sign of that. But one of the biggest problems is, you know, if you if you aren't promising robust economic growth, you can't get elected or reelected. You know, we are so deep in that paradigm that no politician can tell us the truth and have any hope of getting elected. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I was thrilled to get your invitation is, you know, we've got to uh, re-educate uh, the, pub, the general public so that they will elect policymakers who are willing to tell them the truth and willing to change public policy so that it's not dead planet policy. Today, nothing but dead planet policy is being discussed in Washington, D.C. Got to change that. So before we let you get out of here, you know, I'm, I am curious for a little bit of optimism, a little bit of hope from you. Uh, you know, I think part of this conversation is holding in one hand this reality uh, that, you know, we, we might not be able to take the path we're on in a sustainable way and that we, we have to change course. And then the other part of it is kind of how we do that. And I'm wondering if in your perspective, you know, what, what gives you hope about either of those things? What are you seeing that gives you some optimism? Or if, you know, you don't have much hope or optimism about how we might be able to, to change course? You know, some really smart people who really study this day, day in and day out uh, feel like the... Uh, the modern human society, society, the way we're running it today, has maybe another 10 or 20 years and it will have run its course. They think we're very close to, uh, to collapse of the society as we see it. Uh, now, there are some who think that that, that collapse might be 100 years away. Um, but either way, that's not doesn't give you a lot of reason for hope. Uh, and yet here I am. I, I won't give up hope because... The possibility is that we're pretty close to a tipping point. Point right now, it looks like people are too ignorant of this uh, uh, of this situation of overshoot, or, or in too de too much in denial of it. And there's certainly not enough public policy action or individual action to to turn the tide. But you know, who knows? Sometimes things can change on a dime. And maybe my hope is maybe we're really 
close to that tipping point. I know, you know, the climate change conversation was going nowhere and it was just continuing to be debated and uh, climate change deniers were getting equal time on all the on all the news programs. Uh, and I think what happened was uh, Al Gore's An, In An Inconvenient Truth documentary came out. And in the course of about a year, the conversation really changed. Now, in, a, in the course of a year, we didn't suddenly start adopting all the public policies we needed to in order to get carbon emissions uh, peaking and, and, and drastically in, uh, reducing in as fast as we need them to, but at least the conversation changed and very few people are denying climate change today. So I'm looking for that kind of rapid tipping point just in the, in the conversation and hoping that that will lead to uh, uh, the policy changes that we need. And, you know, we have our policy policymakers in D.C., they're so old that we could have a a whole new crop of policymakers in just a matter of a few years. So if we're if we're educating younger people about this, uh, then policies could change fast. All right, Dave Gardner. If people want to keep up with your work or learn more about the degrowth movement, even though we've come to the agreement we don't particularly like that name, where's uh, where's the best place for them to do that? Well, if you listen to podcasts, uh, search for the Growth Busters podcast wherever you listen to those. And uh, uh, growthbusters.org is the website that I created long before I even finished the, the Growth Busters documentary. And it's now over 10 years old, so I made the Growth Busters film free on YouTube. So that's pretty easy to find. Um, and then degrowth, you know, if you Google degrowth, there's uh, a number of organizations that are educating people and promoting that. And I mentioned the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Those are a couple of good organizations that I consider allies, uh, putting out really good material that's uh, that will help educate you and hopefully inspire you to change your own life and to elect some new leadership or to run for office yourself so that we can get, uh, get out of this growth-seeking paradigm we're stuck in. All right, Dave Gardner, thank you so much for the time. I appreciate you coming on the show and hope to do it again sometime. My pleasure, anytime.